Welcome, oh, itchy nose. Welcome to the latest episode of Galfrey Pride Radio. Um, I am your host, Stevie Beauchamp. My co-host here, Clayton Wick. And we are going to talk about the Doctor Who... The Doctor Who television movie is the greatest thing ever. From 1996. No, no. It is the no, no, best the, thing. Yeah, but... Where else do we get to see Eric Roberts change performance of the same character three times in a single movie, starting on complete deadpan and ending on extra gay Ming the Merciless? <laughs> Yes, that is the 1996 Doctor Who movie. Um, it, it's... I, I don't even know where to begin. It is one of the best things ever. Probably one of the more enjoyable Doctor Who experiences, I think. Not always for the right reasons, but it's pretty consistently fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, there were only a few things I didn't really care for in it, but I mean, overall, it is a really solid episode of Doctor Who. Um, and I gotta say, I do enjoy Eric Roberts' performance in this thing. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and I had watched the behind the scenes thing that they, that they had made back in the day. He was the only person that was a fan of the show back really? in the day. I mean, Paul McGann knew about it, and Sylvester McCoy was really happy that McGann was getting it because they were really good friends. Um, but yeah, out of everybody else, um, he's the one that really watched it growing up. That makes a lot of sense. It kind of comes through in his performance. Yeah, and he was really playing the master like they did back in the day when he had the rubbish beard, as a tenant would say. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can actually see a lot of that now that you mention it. Yeah, there's, um... There's a lot of elements that carry over from, like, the five doctors. Yeah, and he just said he just had fun with the role. He took it over the top. That's the way he saw the master being. And I was just like, you know, more power to him. I, it, made, it made the performance all that much more fun. Honestly, I think that he sort of carries the whole thing. Really? I, I think so. I, I mean, he just... There's this weird sort of energy in the role, and I mean, he's sort of inconsistent the way he plays the character, but it makes a certain kind of narrative sense. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if he carries the entire film because I, I really do love McGann oh, as McGann, a doctor. Again, it is great, yeah. but I think that one of the things that really helps to make any good Doctor Who story is whatever the Doctor's adversary is that we Oh yeah, totally. I agree with you on that. And Eric Roberts actually does a really good job with what he's got. Oh, I, 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 t I totally, totally agree. I mean, if I was ever able to chance to actually meet Eric Roberts and get, get him to sign something, if he was ever at, like, a Dragon Con, I mean, if he had a picture of him as the Master, hands down, <laughs> that's what I'm getting signed. Or, you know, if he doesn't have that, I might take the DVD with me just in case to get him to sign something Doctor Who related. Um, because, I mean, uh, I mean, I love him best in the best and so many <laughs> other things that he's done. I think he's a talented Roberts in the family. Um, well, clearly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's willing to do anything, any role. Did Julia Roberts ever do a Doctor Who television movie? Hell no. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I would have to get, I have to get, I would have to get something Doctor Who related signed by him. I'm still waiting for the action figure. Because I have to say, I can't, I don't think they've, uh, made an action figure, figure of his master yet. Huh. And they've only made one eighth Doctor action figure that I know of, and that was in the big set of all 11 of them. Weird. Which would be a really cool, you know, San Diego Comic Con exclusive, you know, the Eric Roberts master and the Paul McGann doctor and a little set. Okay, um, so what did we really like about this episode, or this movie? I, I mean, it breaks down to 74 minutes, so I mean, it pretty much is an episode. Um, it's, it's pretty well paced. It doesn't really drag in too many spots. No. Uh, it's very clearly made by fans of the series. There's too many cute little references to stuff from early classic Who stuff that it, it has to be there because and it's the, not just throwing a bone to the audience because whoever it was who made this thought it was important to have that stuff in. You actually be surprised from what I could gather from the behind the scenes. 
they might have been fans, but they're not the f sort of fans that you think they were. Really? Really, yeah. Um, they went through like three different script writers for it. Um, like I said, I'm trying to get a hold of, of the original script uh, by the guy who, who did this one. Because um, it's just, it's abysmally bad. Um, it just, it really surprised me. Yeah. A lot of the choices they made, like actually continuing on from the Seventh Doctor instead of doing a straight reboot. That would have been the easier thing to do, and in a lot of narrative ways, it probably would have been the smart thing to do. But they thought it was very important to stay within the continuity of what came before. There, there, there was a lot of debate about that, but, I, but from what I could gather, they wanted that sort of connection, at least that connection, from the classic Who to the new Who. Or, I mean, oh wow, actually, no, it, this isn't even new Who. This is sort of like... Ambiguity. This is sort of like the gray area between classic and new. Um, but for Mikey Gather, it was really... Um, it just happened. You know, they got lucky. That, I mean, there was a lot of debate. Do we start it? Do we cut it free? You know, start over totally? Or do we have something for when it's, you know, for the fans? You know, there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of uh, work put into stuff like that, you know, how they were going to approach the beginning. Um, and they decided to, you know, at least carry over from the classic coup. Um, because from what I could gather, um, there, an important piece to all this was uh, the Fox affiliate in Chicago. Um, really? I don't really, I don't know the, the, the exacts to any of this because it, it's only briefly mentioned in the special features and some of the interviews, um, but a lot of one of the biggest Doctor Who conventions in the country um, used to happen, on, or it still might happen um, in Chicago. I can't remember if it, if if that convention is now in L.A. area, California, or if it's still in Chicago. But one of the biggest Doctor Who uh, fan organizations was Chicago, um, and that was very influ influential with. Uh, the movie and the people producing the movie, hmm. of all things, um, I'm really curious to read and see more of the featurettes. And, you know, get a better sense of all that. So, what do we really like? I'm um, getting back to what. What do we really like about this? Um, this TV movie that the Americans did. I think it was interesting seeing how McGann, as the Doctor, spends a good chunk of the movie trying to figure out what a doctor is yeah it does a good it, it does an interesting thing where it actually takes the doctor and for a while there sort of turns him into the point of view character yeah and that's something that they haven't really done so much before and i think it's interesting that they did that it's yeah. just what i love so much about this is that it's taking Doctor Who and doing something new with it. And while it doesn't really work a lot of the time, they're still showing a lot of courage in doing it. Okay. Um, the only other episode I can really think about about that whole uh, point of view thing is uh, the human nature and the family blood episodes. Yeah. Um, where, you know, he, for all intents and purposes, he's not the Doctor and, you know, he has to figure out who he is. Which, um, which really actually ties into all this, strangely enough, is that one of the Paul Cornell novels was Human Nature, um, where Sylvester McCoy, it was actually a Sylvester McCoy adventure, and that's how they sort of say, where they get around the whole half-human thing, at least in this, um, is that there's some residual genetic uh, manipulation still going on from when Sylvester turned himself, or the seventh doctor turned himself human to protect his identity, and it sort of carried over to this doctor, um, cause I gotta say, a lot of the inconsistencies that people had with the movie, um, have been worked out in later books and other things to sort of make the British fans happy and make the diehard fans happy. Um, they, they've, they've worked it out. And honestly, the Master of the Snake actually never, ever bothered me. Yeah, it's... It's kind of easily just sort of excused. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, if you look back at the Tom Baker era when the Master was on his very, very last regeneration, and I mean, he was like almost a, a rotting zombie. I mean, the Master will do anything to survive. I mean, I, I have a harder time with the 
barely audible dialects at the beginning of the film, exterminating the exterminating the master by and, and saying exterminate than I do with the master snake because you don't really hear the dialects. You don't have that classic exterminate voice. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, my, my only my only qualm with this when I watched it the very very first time back in 1996 was the whole half human thing. That was the one thing that drove me crazy because I, I remember screaming at the TV, the doctor's not half human! Um, but now that, you know, they, they've sort of worked out that inconsistency and the continuity, you know, you know, it's a fun episode. I, I could live with the uh, inconsistencies. And I'll say this, I love the TARDIS. I mean, the, the, the TARDIS that they have in the TV movie special is absolutely phenomenal. It's I'm, huge. It's, it's huge. It's... It's grand. Um, they're and like like you said, you know, you think that there were some huge fans of the show that that did this, but because I mean, the interior of the TARDIS, I mean, throw their throwbacks to the first Doctor, the second Doctor in there. I mean, there's a lot of little details in there that just make you think about the other Doctors, even with the fifth Doctor and the cloister room and the cloister bell sound. I mean, they're just those little, those little details. Um, which at least showed that you know the people making this did at least care about the past, even if they weren't uber fans. Yeah. Um, but I would really love it if Matt Smith had this TARDIS interior than the one he has right now, because I'm not a huge fan of that. And I think this was the first, you know, wow, the TARDIS could be this grand thing again, and that that teeny tiny room that we ended up with during the third and fourth Doctor's run, which which ended up making it the small little room with with the big interior. But now we have the big interior with with all the other all the other areas. I really do think the TARDIS loses something when you can see the entirety of the control room in a single wide shot. Yeah, and this did a really good job of getting away from that. Oh yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that this TARDIS interior influenced all of New Who's interiors. You know that you could have this grand console room again. You know, where it doesn't have to be the teeny tiny room. I mean, because this is sort of that, that gray area between classic and, and, and new who. Um, and this is the first place that really explored that since the first and second Doctors, which had a bigger a bigger console room to begin with. Wasn't this also the first time that they really used the whole gold dust effect to represent TARDIS energy? Yeah, that, that I can think of. I mean, I actually, I, when I was watching it dematerialize for the last time, I kind of liked that sort of... Oh, God, oh, that sort of glowing uh, aurora borealis thing that was left in its wake. Yeah, I thought that was a nice little touch. Yeah, the um, special effects are really high quality given the sort of budget that they had and the yeah. fact it was being made in the mid nineties. Oh yeah, um, and you know a lot of people were really surprised when it didn't get because I finally found out because I was doing a little research about it that McGann was signed for five more stories. Really. Yeah, um, there are going to be pretty much remakes of some of the, the more classic episodes, um, but it just didn't get the ratings for it. But it it had re if you really look at what it was going up against the night it aired originally, if I remember correctly, it was the World Series, and it was either at the very beginning of the World Series or the very end. You know, those two critical times of the World Series, it did really well ratings wise with what it went up against. But, of course, I guess Fox figured that it didn't do well enough. Which is a real shame, because, I mean, I would have loved, loved to have seen more McGann. I mean, because I, I think he's absolutely a phenomenal Doctor that did not get his chance. Yeah. Fox is kind of a weird network, though. They take chances on stuff that can't have a chance anywhere on any other network, and then they just sort of cut it loose sometimes a little too early. Yeah, they're notoriously bad. Firefly. I'm still mourning the tick. See, I never saw the tick. <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, that's that's all I've ever heard, uh, but I've just never seen a single episode. And I, I'm actually a huge tick fan, too. And it has Patrick Warburton. <sighs> and I'm a huge Patrick Warburton fan. I mean, Dude, Patrick Warburton should be on Doctor Who. He should be the Doctor. No, he's American. He's also Patrick Warburton. Doesn't matter, he's American. Do you know, actually, three really big names turned down the TV movie? Who? Uh, Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, and Jim Carrey. 
What? Hanks and Cruz turned it down because they felt the doctor had to be British. Um, Carrie had never really ever watched Doctor Who, but after he watched it, he was just like, I can't do this because the doctor's British. Um, and the American fans probably would not like it. Weird. Yeah, um, and then, you know, they had, then they were like, okay, what are some of the British A-listers at the time that might, might take over the role, you know, we might want to use in the role, um, and one of the names that really stands out, because, I mean, I just scrolled on the list really, the list really quick, one was Sean Bean, hmm. um, and then you got, like, the secondary characters, secondary actors, some of them are comedic, one of them was, like, Roy Atkinson was on top of that list. Wow. Uh, which of course he did eventually get to play the doctor in the uh, in the Curse of the Fatal Death, even though it's sort of a spoof and a, and a comedy. You know, he does get a chance to finally come back and play that part. Yeah, but and he's great. Oh yeah, no, I mean I could have seen, especially I mean, with his black outer stuff, I could have seen him play the part. Yeah, I I would have been on board for that. Oh yeah, um, I don't know if I would I would choose him to be the one to relaunch the show with. But I could see him as a doctor at some point, you know. Yeah, he'd be good. Um, yeah. Um, but again, they, they eventually uh, settled on Paul McGann, which I absolutely, I mean, he's a really good doctor. I mean, the more I think of that, more more that I've seen, um, I really, really enjoy this doctor. Um, of course, I don't know if I like the... I love this current wardrobe that he's wearing in the movie. I don't like his new outfit that they gave him. Oh, yeah, it's kind of bad. Yeah, it kind of looks like a steampunkish type thing. Leather coat and stuff, like uh, Aviator. And I do not like the sonic screwdriver. And, and actually, after I saw the screwdriver, I couldn't believe what I was the one that created it because it looks absolutely atrocious. Didn't they give him a poofy shirt? Well, I've only ever seen him with the uh, jacket on. And I was just like, it looks like the Rocketeer without the helmet. Um, that's what I felt about it. Not a huge fan of it. Um... What are the things have that I can say about this? So, what didn't you like about it? I mean, we talked a lot about what we liked about it. Honestly, I thought both of the companions were pretty weak. I mean, if you even want to count Lee as a companion, which he he's kind of he's actually I know he's considered to be one. He, he is considered to be one, um, and so is, I mean, so is Grace, obviously. Um, but the interesting fact is, this is, these are the only appearances of those two characters as his companion. Like, with the stuff that came afterwards, like the audios and stuff, from what I could gather in the comics, they neither one of them appeared. It's kept kind of vague whether or not they were going to come back if, this, if it got picked up for a series, but... Yeah, I, I don't really see there as being anywhere else to go with either character. No. Um, and an interesting thing about the kiss they shared is McGann was actually sort of against a kiss. So when he actually kissed Grace, he kissed, because he didn't think the doctor should kiss, because, I mean, he's a real classic who. Um, he kissed her with a, with his mouth closed, and the producers and the directors did not catch it. Because, um, I mean, he would not, you know, do the real passionate type thing. Yeah. Um, and in the original script, it was only supposed to be one kiss, and then um, another comment's made. Um, and they carry on. There, originally, there weren't there weren't the two kisses hmm. right in a row. Um, that was something that was added in um, uh, while they were filming. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I did a lot of research because I'm still trying to find the original script of this thing, where we meet the Doctor's father, Ulysses, and all this other crazy stuff. It's really bad, from what I can gather. I glean bits and pieces, but not the whole script. Um, I'm trying to think of any other. So, was there anything else you didn't like about about it? It's kind of painfully nineties. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no getting around that or escaping it. No. But it's very clear watching it that it's from the whole. Buffy the Vampire Slayer era of sci-fi and fantasy television. But when did um, Buffy first air? I want to say 97. Okay, so a year, a year later. Maybe late 96. Okay. I think it's 97. 
I just honestly I can't remember. But yeah, it's just you know, in terms of production values, in terms of even direction. Yeah. There's the direction style sort of has that whole thing that sort of suggests that it's being done by someone who either watched or directed a lot of MTV. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one thing I did, I did like about it, this is probably one of the most action-oriented Who episodes ever. Yeah, and, um, and it works. Oh, it does. I mean, it, it works surprisingly well. Um, I mean, I'm glad I saw it when it came out, but I could appreciate it all that much more now with what they did, style choices, and everything. Um, but yeah, you know, I really like those action sequences. And, I mean, I've never seen a British action film. I mean, I've seen a lot of horror, I've seen a lot of drama and stuff like that. But I really haven't seen many, a lot of British action films. And I'd really be curious to see it, to see, you know, what their take on action is, because you can, you can clearly tell that was a heavily American influence type thing in this movie was the action, the chase scenes. But in the end, it's still, you know, you never really see the doctor throw a punch or anything. No, it no, no. It all comes no. down to the doctor just being smarter than the guy who's bigger and stronger than him. Yeah. Which is really what it should always be about. Oh, totally. They, they still kept true to the essence of the character, even when they introduced those action elements. Oh, yeah, I, oh I mean, I, I, I wholeheartedly yes, agree. I know that the third Doctor beat the crap out of a lot of people, but that's different. Yeah. He's special. He was special. He, he, they figured they were going to compete with James Bond with that Doctor. Um, oh, some other interesting tidbits I found out about uh, this. When you see Tom Baker's scarf yeah. in this... That was originally supposed to be the Six Doctors costume. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, luckily, we did not get that. Um, that. That just would have been unfortunate. Yeah. And I think less people would have caught the reference. Because, I mean, strangely enough, I mean, from time to time, I do have a Baker scarf. And from time to time, when it's really cold out, I'll wear it because it's warm. And a lot of people will recognize a scarf, even if they don't fully remember where, they, where they've seen it. And, but then, you know, eventually, you know, if, if I'm still around, you can see that they finally realize what they saw it from, usually from PBS or something, but, you yeah. know, they recognize a scarf. Well, it's just, it's better to go with the scarf, I think, because you just go, oh, cool, a scarf. Like the fourth Doctor used to wear. Yeah. But if they throw in the Colin Baker Doctor costume, then then it stops being sort of a cute reference and sort of just becomes a family guy joke. Yeah. You know, hey guys, look at this thing from that thing you used to watch. Isn't yeah. it funny that we made a reference to it? Do you, do you know what the other really big... Uh... Doctor Who scarf references that I can remember huh. from a non-British type thing is um, Space Jams. Um, when the aliens, the, the, when they were still really skinny, s small things, when they're at the basketball game, watching everybody play for the first time, yeah. they're actually wrapped in a trench coat and the scarf. Oh. So I thought, I was like, oh wow, Space Jams, Doctor Who reference, the only good thing about this movie. Bill Murray was in it. He was in it. He, yeah, he, yeah. He'll be in Space Jams, but not Ghostbusters 3. Maybe he really needed the money. Maybe. Well, it's pre lost in translation, so. Maybe. Maybe Michael Jordan saved his life, and, you know, similar to the Wookiees, he had to repay the debt. <laughs> the life debt, yeah. It's quite possible. Oh. Um, other than that, I pretty much don't have anything. Yeah. But well, we're on the subject yes. of Bill Murray. I do think it's worth pointing out. A friend of mine once said about Bill Murray, there aren't many things that I'll put in my rectum, but Bill Murray is one of them. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm not going to judge him, but I am going to say I can see where he's coming from. You're going to cut that, aren't you? No, I'm not. 
Oh, okay, good. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to, trying to say I can seg segue to the next thing I wanted to say without it seeming, seeming like I'm, I'm bashing, but um, I'm not bashing at all. Um, but one thing I did, I find interesting. I love the social features on on the on the DVD set um, that this came out um, with. Because, I mean, I learned so much more about some of the behind-the-scenes stuff and how the British people thought about the, show, about the, uh, about the um, story. You know, they, they, they complained about the American, the American side of, of all this, but they absolutely adored McGann. Yeah, so, he's, he's just... he's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I don't really have any complaints about him. Yeah. Well, he, he only had the one, and I think he did a hell of a job with his one, his the one story. Yeah. Though he did come back and do a lot of the audio dramas. Oh, yeah. But it's just, I mean, yeah. I love Tennant, but I have complaints about him sometimes. Oh, I mean... I love Smith, but I have complaints about him. Yeah. But, I mean, McGann just did a pretty all-around good job. Yeah. Um, and one other, another interesting fact about the McGann Doctor, um, and this takes place within the um, comics... Um, is that he had the first gay companion. Oh. She was a lesbian. She, you know, she didn't start off as, I mean, it wasn't blatant, and, I mean, they let, they let the character explore her sexuality, mm -hmm. um, and it turned out that, you know, she, she became a lesbian, which I thought, or was always a lesbian, I mean, I'm something like you flick a switch and become, but, I mean, it's interesting that, that they did that. I mean, he had the first gay companion, and a really interesting, interesting thing that almost connected his connected this with New Who and the comics was, but because of some legality issues, um, Russell Davies actually originally um, asked them if they wanted to show the regeneration in the comics. Oh. Um, but what, but I guess I'm not sure the way this all works is they couldn't show the regeneration before the first episode, but they couldn't show the regeneration after the first op episode aired. Really? Yeah. I'm not sure. They didn't really go into why that was. Hmm. Um, so I guess the only way that actually could have worked was if that magazine, if that comic came out the exact same day that the episode aired. Um... But yeah, no, he originally had offered them the regeneration scene. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, what I, that's how I felt. I was like, wow, really? That's amazing. But um, it never happened. Yeah, now it looks like we're probably never going to get that scene. At least not done properly. We're never going to see him again turn into Eccleston. Well, I mean... With CG nowadays, I think it, it it would be possible, and I mean they, there are enough shots from the show where they might be able to jury rig something. Yeah. Um, I just hope they don't go that route. I don't think I don't. I mean I don't think they will. Um, I am curious to see what they're going to carry over into the fiftieth anniversary. Um, I mean, I'm I mean. I'm pretty sure we're gonna see him again. I mean, he's already said he would come back without without a second thought. Yeah. I mean, he would even come back before the 50th anniversary. Um, I think I read an interview with him where he had said that he's happy to come back as long as they don't make him wear a wig. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, I'm, that kind of makes me wonder. I mean, are we gonna see Grace again? Are we gonna see the Chinese dude again? Um, are we gonna see the Eric Roberts master again? I mean, what are we going to see out of this movie? Or are we going to see stuff that appeared in the comic and not in this? I mean, it's this is going to be really curious to see how they're going to use this in the 50th anniversary. I don't know exactly how they'd use him, but... Eric Roberts would probably come back if he's a Doctor Who fan. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that's one of the reasons why he took the part was because he was a Doctor Who fan. And honestly, I did not mind the, the Master being American in this at all. I am just, the only thing I wanted British in this was the Doctor, and they stuck to it. And it doesn't even really feel that out of place for a Doctor Who episode with it being so Americanized. The only thing that really seems off 
is the number of Americans who are being played by Americans. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. So, I mean, technically, you know, this, this honestly would be the first stuff that was filmed, a Doctor Who episode that was actually filmed in the States, and not, you know, the Matt Smith. Because, yeah. I mean, this was a co-production of, of the BBC. I mean, the BBC did have, you know, a say in this. Not a lot. I mean, I don't think they really cared. But, I mean, they did have some say. So, I mean, this is a, a co-production. Yeah, um, but the current team hates this movie so much. I don't think they really count it. Well, I don't, I don't think they, 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 they... I mean, they may not like it. I don't think they, they fully hate it. Because, I mean, if they, if they truly hated it, I mean, I don't think Moffat would even begin to think about including any of this in the 50th anniversary. And I don't think he would have said this, the comment that everything that we've ever seen in some way is canon because she now that he's shows that time can be rewritten. And I mean, the show's always been about rewriting time and history. I mean, the dialects are, and the Cybermen are, are like key examples of that. This is maybe the least problematic thing that comes up because of that statement, though. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that is true. And um, that's leaving in the... We are close to running out of tape, though. Oh, sorry about that. Um, there will be a jump. I don't know what we lost, but what we still had. But we ran out of power. Um, but we are getting to the end of our tape on this one. So um, before before it cut, we were talking about you know the, the 50th anniversary and, and how they would bring this back into it and um, and just just how much they maybe dis or not dislike. Uh, this uh, movie with the current production. Um, There's also like a 20 minute long digression where I explain my belief that Galaxy Quest takes place within the Doctor Who universe. Yes, that was quite uh, quite enlightening, especially with their uh, little magic button that they have, which is probably a teeny tiny TARDIS. And, and Tony Shalhoub. Yes, that's right, he is in that, isn't he? Well, the problematic one really is Tim Allen. <laughs> yeah. Which actually, I have an interesting story about Galaxy Quest. Um, they almost ended up in a legal battle with uh, another actor who wrote a book. I'm not going to say the actor's name because I know the actor very, very well. Um, but he had co-written a book with this other with with an author, and it. There's a really good chance that the Galaxy Quest script was based on, on his book. You know William Shatner? <laughs> not... I, I've, I've read across Shatner. I do not know Shatner. This is somebody else. Um, but yeah, no. Um, and they really did contemplate legal action mm. um, over, over it. But um, since we're running, we're running out of tape here, is there anything else you want to say about the uh, Doctor Who movie? Um... Yeah, it's really good. Other than that, I don't really have anything. Yeah. And like I said, I can't argue. I mean, this is a very, very fun episode. I mean, I think my biggest qualm about the entire thing is that the Doctor, they say the Doctor's half human, but, you know, they've rectified that now um, with with some of the uh, books and, and things that have come since. Um, they found a way of sort of justifying that... Um, that statement, um, and one thing which really disappointed, this is the one thing that disappointed me, in one shot it looks like the actor has two different colored eyes, and I thought that was like the coolest thing ever, but that was just a lighting effect, and mm -hmm. then you see that his eyes are both the same color, I thought it would have been really cool if we had a doctor with two different color eyes. Yeah. Because it would just be really, 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 really quirky, and you know, an, inter an interesting aspect of the regeneration, but Dude, I don't... David Bowie should be the doctor. Well, he fits my criteria. He could very easily be the doctor in my book. And it'd be like a hundred percent more believable if he boned Jack Harkness. I got nothing. Yeah. You broke me with that one. I think we're pretty much out of time. We are. So uh, thank you for watching this latest episode. I have no idea what we're going to watch next week. Um, no idea whatsoever. Um, it actually might, we might finally finish off, uh, Torchwood. Uh, 
uh, I forget, uh, Miracle Day. Um, I, I just haven't decided. And that was some sort of weird noise. Maybe we're being broken into. Maybe we're about to be murdered and killed. So until next time, this is Gallifrey Pirate Radio signing off.